Hello students, welcome back to the science class. Last week, we have learned about the structures of the cell membrane and their components. So today, we are going to learn about the cell signaling, diffusions, and osmosis. So without further ado, let's begin our lesson. Cell signaling is the fundamental process by which specific information is transferred from the cell surface to the cytosols and ultimately to the nucleus, leading to the changes in the gene's expression. Why do living organisms need signaling? All cells in organisms must be able to respond appropriately to their environment. When you fall and get injured, your body tries to cover the wound through a blood clotting process. Your body is an incredible living system made up of billions of cells. We are following blood cells as they are propelled through the blood vessels toward the injury sites. If you are hurt, your cells work together to repair the damage. They communicate using their own language of chemical signals. The cell signaling is possible because of the complex range of signaling pathways which coordinate the activities of cells, even if they are large distance apart in the same body. Look at the figure 4.6 on your textbook, page 77. The figure shows the basic signaling pathway, which includes first, receiving a stimulus or signal, Second, transmitting the message to the target or effector. Third, making an appropriate response. Conversions of the original signals to a message that is then transmitted or response is called transduction. Transmitting the message involves crossing barriers such as the cell surface membranes. Signaling molecules are very diverse. If they are hydrophobic, such as steroid hormones, they can diffuse directly across the cell membrane and bind to the receptors in the cytoplasm or nucleus. But more commonly, the signaling molecule is water-soluble or hydrophilic. In this case, they need special signaling pathways. First, signal arrives at a protein receptor in a cell surface membrane. Second, the signals bring about a change in the shape of the receptor. Third, the message passed to the inside of the cells. Third, the changing of the receptor shape allows it to interact with the G proteins. Fifth, G protein will bring about the release of second messenger which will relay the message. Six, second messengers greatly amplifying the signal. Seven, second messenger activates an enzymes. Eight, enzyme is produced to do the cell functions such as secretions, transcriptions, movement, metabolic change, and many more. Movement of the substances into and out of the cells. There are two types major movement of substances into and out of the cells. First, passive transport. Second, active transport. Passive transport is the movement of ion or molecule via a concentration gradient or from an area of high concentrations to an area of low concentrations without the need of energy. Active transport is the movement of ions or molecule against the concentration gradient or from an area of low concentrations to an area of high concentrations with the need of energy. Now, let's talk about the passive transport. Passive transport includes diffusion and osmosis. What is diffusion? Ever wonder how substances move around the body? Or how a metabolite gets in and out of the cells? Or how perfume spray spread the aroma around in a matter of seconds from the corner to spray it to the rest of your rooms? Diffusion is to be blamed. Yes. It is the kind of transport in which dissolved substances of particles move from the regions of higher concentrations to lower concentrations with no external energy involved. Since this transport does not require energy from external source, it is also called passive transport. 
Diffusion occurs when particles, gases, or default substances are mobile or free to move as they spread from where they are in high concentrations to the regions where they are in low concentrations throughout the concentrations gradient. The concentration gradient is an environment in which particles are distributed in different concentrations, keeping high concentration regions on one side and low concentrations on the other side. In the human body, the blood takes oxygen using the simple mode of passive transport, in which oxygen moves from alveoli or air spaces in which it happens to be in higher concentration to the blood where it is used to be in lower concentration. It can also be conceived as a mode of transport in which substances move from the regions of abundance to the regions of demand where their concentration is lower. Cells use a bit different yet sophisticated kind of divisions. They use some carrier proteins to take in the required substance of nutrients. And since this mode involves facilitations of these proteins to allow the substances inside their cells through the membrane, this kind of division is called facilitated division. An important example is that of blood. Oxygen binds with the red blood cells in the bloodstream through facilitated divisions, which give us oxygenated blood. Now, let us get to know one more interesting concept named osmosis. Have we ever come across this term of osmosis? Well, quite often. But what exactly do we mean by this? Osmosis is defined as the movement of water from higher water concentration to lower water concentrations through a semi-permeable membrane. So let us say we have this container which is partitioned by this semi-permeable membrane. Now we add sugar solutions at both these sides. However, the concentration of each is different. Here, we add concentrated sugar solution, while here, dilute sugar solution. That means, the concentrations of water in the solution is obviously more compared to this. So, after some time, you see water molecules moving from this side of the partition to this side. And how long this movement will take place? It will occur until the concentrations of water is balanced that is equalized on both the sides i think that's all about our lesson today don't forget to do the exercise on edmodo see you